This week I've been thinking about butterflies. Each butterfly that you see is unique and beautiful. They're very similar, but no one butterfly is identical to another butterfly. Their markings differ like our fingerprints differ. And so the question that has been mulling in my mind this week is what connects butterflies? Now don't ask me why that question has been mulling in my mind. It has. Yes, they're all from the same kingdom, from the same phylum, class and order. They're all insects, six-legged arthropods. But in one's spirit, one senses a deeper connection than mere similarity, especially when a kaleidoscope of butterflies suddenly crosses one's path from nowhere. And on reflection, that deeper and immutable connection that butterflies have is this, that they share the same creator. They're not randomly butterflies that pass your path as just some kaleidoscope of chance. They are the explicit expression, thought, creation, planning, consideration and handiwork of a person. And that person's name is God. The deepest connection for butterflies is therefore not their similarity, but God himself. A kaleidoscope of butterflies is an expression of a thought of God. And when you zoom into that picture... You see his individual thoughts. Why? Because each butterfly is uniquely made by him. And so think about it. By analogy, the same applies to us. Our deepest connection is not our similarities as human beings. Our deepest and most immutable connection is that we share the same creator. Hence, the Bible starts with these profound words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We connect in the person of God who exists separately from us, over and above creation, but indwells us by his Holy Spirit. So Christian unity in this age that we live in is then specifically in and through the Holy Spirit. But what I want you to notice is that our connection through the Holy Spirit does not nullify the fact that each one of us has been made uniquely. We, we retain the element of being unique. And that is important to consider. So I want us to reflect together on the matter of why God created each one of us uniquely. What does that mean to us? And why does that uniqueness exist despite our similarities? Let's reflect on that. I have three brothers. We differ in personality, good looks and world view, even though we have the same parents. And even though we grew up in the same home, we were born different by God's design. Right at the beginning, we were different. So even though we share common traits, we also fundamentally differ. Do you know that even today we struggle to agree on matters? We still see matters often vastly different. I may know you very well, but I'm not you. And even though you and I will have common experiences of God, shared experiences of God, we will also have our own and unique experiences of God, which will lie only between us and God and no one else. Why? Because God made us uniquely. To give an example, I love poetry and things dramatic. I love Macbeth by Shakespeare. My wife is considerably less so inclined and suffers much, I think especially at the hands of my being dramatic. I will read a poem and in the moment the alliteration of the sentence will touch me deeply. Uh, or the rhyming of the words, especially if the rhyming is not obvious. I will be touched by the organic order of the words, the beauty of the sound of the words. And I will literally in that moment have a God moment because it is he who brings rhyme and rhythm and order and beauty in all things. Language is one of the ways God has made me to connect with him. 
And it's intimate because I know, he knows, I enjoyed him in that moment in the poem. But your experience may be different from mine and it will be validly yours. You may love maths like my sons do. I don't understand why people would enjoy maths, but they love maths. You may experience God in the solution of an equation, in subtracting or dividing or multiplying, because God subtracts and God divides and God multiplies. He orders. He brings the complex to solution. He is the greatest mathematician. He is the creator of maths. And you may be designed by him to find him there. And you may have a God moment in a subtraction or in an adding or in a multiplication or when a sum or an equation is resolved. Do you see you have the propensity, each one of us, to unique fellowship and intimacy with God over and above the shared intimacy that we all have. No one can replicate your relationship with God or take your place. And that is profound. If you grasp that, you'll, be, you'll not be trying to live your relationship with God through a pastor or through another person. You will also not be looking to replicate another spirituality, uh, to imitate John Wesley or Calvin or anybody else. You will realize, if you grasp this, the value of pursuing your own deep and unique, unique relationship with God. And you will know that it's a matter of urgency. Why? Because we have so little time on earth for this. Now what I've said is not some me on my own God thing that I'm trying to promote. Because when you're connected to God, to Him, you are connected to me. Because we share Him as the deepest point of our connection, as I've said before. And for God, fellowship in the body of Christ is incredibly important. Unity. Go read John chapter 17. You may direct your love to Him, but did you know that God directs His love uniquely in relation to who you are to your situation and to your heart. God does not use a one-fits-all generic type of love. His love is very, very personal, very focused, very purposeful. And let me explain this principle briefly to you at the hand of a parable. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? He is the one who took his father's inheritance and then went away and squandered it. And then eventually came back after he repented. I'm sure you've heard more than one sermon on it before. Very often the focus in preaching on that parable is on the prodigal son himself. But that is dead wrong because the focus of the parable is actually on the father. And to come to the fullness of the parable, the father must stand at the center of it. And the parable teaches us who the father is, who God is. And how that father, how God deals with two uniquely different sons. The first son is wild, reckless, impulsive, wastes his inheritance with no regard to his father or anybody else. The second son is conscientious, rules driven, focused, steady, but also jealous and angry. But what is important to see is is the manner in which the father treats each son. He treats each son tenderly, but differently. He seeks relationship with each, although they differ completely in personality and manner of life. He runs out, embraces his prodigal son, kisses him. And in turn, with the other son, he speaks kindly seeking to draw him back because God is always seeking to draw us back into a relationship with him. And I think often we miss how beautifully he speaks to the eldest son. Listen, listen to how he speaks to the eldest son. Luke chapter 15 verses 31 to 32. The father says, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. 
have to love that. The kindness with which the father speaks to the son who's angry with him. You see, this parable teaches us that God is turned towards each one of us in the way of tenderness and seeking connection. Whether we are the reckless sinner who seeks forgiveness or whether we are the hardened and judge, judgmental brother who wants justice. Think about it. Our deepest point of connection, God, is not just sitting around waiting for us to connect with him. But he is continually reaching out to connect to each and every one of us very uniquely. Running out to meet us where we are. Speaking to us in love. Doing whatever is necessary so that we may have connection. So much so that Jesus Christ died for us on a cross. He speaks to us in love and he speaks to us very specifically. Remember how Jesus spoke to Peter and how he restored Peter. Remember how Jesus spoke differently to Mary and Martha. Remember how kindly, go read that again, Genesis chapter 4, God spoke to Cain even when Cain was angry with God. Our God made us unique. And he interacts with us uniquely as well. I close. You have the propensity to unique fellowship and intimacy with God. No one can replicate your relationship with God or take your place. Do not be embarrassed by who you are. Embrace who he has made in you. God is to be enjoyed and you will enjoy him in your own unique way. Additional to what is shared with others. When you enjoy God, He is glorified. And it's an organic and a natural process. It's not forced. It's not awkward. God loves you. His heart is directed towards you as a unique person. His thoughts are kind. And when He speaks to you, whether most sternly or not, it is always in love. And lastly, God loves connection. He loves connection. He loves you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, gracious and kind and loving and merciful and always reaching out to us. May you bless us to understand your handiwork in who we are. And may we find you, seek you, enjoy you in the spaces you've created for that, specifically in our unique personalities and situations. May you be glorified in our lives as we enjoy you. Bind us together, Lord. May not one of us ever fall in the error of thinking we can go it alone. We are one body connected in Christ through the Spirit for your glory. May you grant us, Lord, great pleasure in you. And may we, Lord, have understanding and wisdom in these matters. And we pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.